Okay, welcome to lecture nine. Um, last time we talked about uh, synthesizing uh, or how to design uh, serial systems. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about serial elements um, and then hybrid systems and elements, their synthesis and analysis. So um, this will get us uh, pretty far. Okay, so um, serial flexure elements. Okay, so you might recall there's three ways to categorize elements. And, and remember an element, a flexure element is, um, uh, you know, a, a flexible geometry that um, deforms over the entire geometry and constrains certain directions while allowing other directions typically, right? And they're, they're modeled or they're drawn in schematics just as springs, um, you know, traditional springs. Um, and there's three categories of them. There are parallel ones that satisfy these conditions. Um, they're ones that the strict definition of a parallel system is, um, uh, you know, if constraint lines can be drawn directly from one rigid body to the next and pass entirely through the element's geometry, and if such constraint lines can fill the element's entire geometry so the whole thing's blue, then the element is a parallel element, okay? And you draw it schematically like this, okay? All right, um, serial elements, of course, are elements, uh, and hybrid elements are elements that violate these conditions, therefore they're not parallel, and they often look like they are um, just parallel elements stacked in series like this, okay? But, you know, this looks like two blades joint stacked in series. Um, it's important, though, that there's no rigid body at the junction. Um, it needs to either be a point or a line like this or a curve, okay? As you'll see, there, there can be point lines or curves, just not rigid bodies like this, right? And so you'd schematically draw them with a dot that joins the two, uh, not a rectangular block, or it would be a serial system, okay? And then there's hybrid elements. Uh, which you can see is, is combinations of parallel and serial elements put together within a single uh, element, okay? Now remember, no element in and of itself, um, even though mathematically speaking all elements including wires are uh, technically mathematically over constrained because they are never perfect and ideal and you can fit a bunch of blue lines in there. Um, uh, right, it's just not useful to think of that, so wires with finite diameters are considered just a single blue line with an order of constraint of one. Uh, flexure blades are, are, you know, reasonably thick, are considered thin enough that they're, they're a, a plane of, of constraint lines with an order of constraint of three. And all elements, parallel, serial, or hybrid, none of them are considered over constraint. They just have orders of constraint. Um, now, when you put them together in parallel or, you know, the, these kind of things we've been talking about, it, then you count their order of constraint as the number of constraints they're adding to the situation, and they, they can over-constrain it if you have multiple ones, right? But an element in and of itself is never over-constrained. It just has an order of constraint, okay? And that's, that's true across all three, all right? So let's look at um, serial elements now, okay? Okay, so on the top here, these are flexures, uh, elements that um, I showed you in the parallel elements lecture. This is a circular hyperboloid flexure. It's a hyperbolic paraboloid flexure. And this doesn't have a name, but it's just you rotate the blue lines back and forth, kind of. And here's that um, V kind of flexure blade thing. You'll notice, um, uh, you know, they're parallel because they satisfy the condition that blue lines can be connected to their two rigid bodies that they join without ever exiting the geometry, and they can be filled entirely blue. So we could have painted those whole thing blue with lines that satisfy that first condition. So it's parallel. Now if you take these exact things and stack them in series, so you can see this is stacked in series with itself, and here it's connecting at a curve. There's no rigid body there, it's just a, a curve. And here it's connecting at a line. Here it's connecting at a weird curve. And there it's, it's connecting the line. Um, Right, um, then these are, these are stacked uh, in series, right? At least, at least these first three, I'll, I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but these elements were just literally stacked on top of each other in, in series. And uh, like I said, there's no rigid body in between, so the whole thing deforms over its, its, uh, over its geometry. And just because you stacked it in series doesn't mean it automatically makes it a serial element. It has to 
not satisfy uh, the parallel condition. So you might ask yourself, are there any blue lines, now that we've stacked this in series, that can connect these two rigid stages, pass entirely through it, never exit it, and can it fill it all blue? If it was the case, whether we stack this in series or not, it would have been a parallel element. As long as it satisfied those conditions, it's a parallel element. But um, in this case, there's no blue line that, that can connect these, these two and, and pass within this geometry. So it, it's definitely not a parallel element. And then because it's two stacked in series um, at, at a curve here, this is a serial element. Okay? This one, you might ask yourself, you know, is this a parallel element? Are there blue lines that uh, connect these two rigid bodies? And the answer is, well, there is at least that one. So you can draw one right up the center. That one uh, works, um, but, and it never leaves the geometry. But there is no more. You, can't, you certainly can't fill the rest of the geometry with blue lines. So it's not a parallel element. And since it's two stacked in series, it's a serial element. Okay. Uh, this one, there is two that satisfy the condition. It just goes straight up and down, two parallel ones. Um, but th there's no more. And so you certainly can't fill this all in blue. So it's not parallel. It is definitely serial. Now, um, you might look at this one. Does this one, can you fill, you know, are there any blue lines there? Sure, there is these two crossed blue lines um, that satisfy the condition that connect this ground to, or th this, this ground to this rigid stage or, you know, whatever, um, without exiting its geometry. Um, but again, you can't fill it. So it's, it's definitely not parallel. But the question is, you might look at this and say, well, this is, um, this is, uh, this is uh, hybrid. That's not serial. Um, and let, let me explain to you here, draw a schematic. I'm going to raise this up a little bit. Okay. Oh, okay. So, oh, let's see. Looks like I've still got a drawing from the past here. Okay, so... If we drew a schematic of it, if you ever wonder if something, so it's, it's, you, you know it's not parallel, okay? So, but the question is, is it parallel or serial element? Th this one is clearly serial because they're just two parallel modules stacked in series, right? But if you ever wonder, um, you know, what, what its condition is, like for instance this is two parallel ones stacked in series, you can draw, you know, the, the rectangular stage and then draw your, your um, spring, put a dot where they join and draw another spring, and that's obviously a serial configuration, right? For this one, a good schematic would be, you know, you draw the rectangle. Um, th these are obviously the V blade flexures up there, and so that counts as a single parallel spring, right? Okay, and then this one also counts as a single parallel spring. I guess they, they join together at, well, I, I didn't draw that very well. They, they join together at a point line or curve. On the schematic, you draw it as a point. And then you draw another spring here. And you draw another spring here. And then this would be your stage. So this is the schematic configuration. This Every little spring, you'll notice uh, on the previous slide, yeah, you know, each spring has to be a parallel element. And if it's this one's stacked in series, it's like this. There's two springs there. Okay, so if you go back to this one, you've got one parallel spring there, one parallel spring there. They join at a dot, one parallel spring there, one parallel spring there. Uh, and and they, they connect the stage. So the question is, is this, if you, but you might think, well, this is this is a weird combination of, you know, parallel and serial things. Maybe it's hybrid. Well, one way to clear it up is, Take the point, line, or curve where they join. And on the schematic, it's always going to be a point, because on schematics, you only do points, right? But in reality, they connect at this line here, right? What you could do is just get rid of this um, point and draw it, like pretend it's a rigid body, OK? And, and then ask yourself, is this a serial system or a hybrid system? Well. This is clearly a parallel module. It's just two bodies connected directly together by parallel elements, which is that element, right? So this is a parallel module. And then this one is another parallel module that is two parallel, you know, two bodies connected together by two parallel elements. Again, that element arranged in parallel. So these are obviously two parallel systems stacked in series, 
And so that is obviously, that's one of the, that, that's exactly what a serial system is. And so if it would be classified as a serial system, then when we get rid of this uh, rigid body and again make it a point line or curve or on the schematic just a point, uh, then it's, it's clearly a serial element, okay? So that, that's what you do to check if it's a parallel. So if, if when you did this, this process, it ended up being clear it's a hybrid system, then you'd know it's a hybrid element. But, but this one is clearly, uh, you know, would be two parallel or systems stacked in series, and that, is, that is definitely falls under the um, series uh, definition. So it's a serial element. Okay, so again, do your check with the blue lines first. If it doesn't satisfy the conditions, you know it's not parallel. Um, and then draw, find out how many parallel springs it can be broken into, draw their schematic, and ask yourself, is it serial or hybrid? And that'll answer the question whether it's a serial element or a hybrid element. And remember, these definitions, I'm gonna really split hairs about how you classify things as parallel, serial, hybrid for systems and elements because a fact won't work. It'll give you wrong answers um, if you use definitions different than my definitions, okay? And I'll give you some examples of that. Okay, so here is a flexor element that's very useful. Um, you know, many uh, people come wanting to consult with me, want me to design flexors that just achieve a single translational degree of freedom but packaged in a cylindrical tube, essentially. That's very often what people want to achieve is by far the most common and there's many ways you can do that um, you know you can do it with you know the most obvious way is is parallel planes you know of course achieve a, a, a single translation you can just put a diaphragm flexures on in, in, on the s sides of cylinders to get get to translations but um, and, and that's not a bad idea, and you can make those serial by putting slits and slots in them and stuff, um, and, and they can become hybrid as well and have diaphragm flexors that can move really far. Um, but another less obvious way to do it is to embed the flexures within the walls of the empty cylinder um, by using these curved blade flexures. Okay, so you can see here this body up here is ground, there's another ground on the other side, and then this body's ground, that body's ground, okay? And so they all go from this ground, curve flexures on the outside of the cylinder to this body, the same thing down here, they curve up here, okay? And so you get the, these, this, this body translates and that body translates, and then it goes from this translating body up here to another one that connects like this. So you can see that, it kind of connects there. So now you have this body and this body which are connected together by this like mirror thing in the center. And now this is, is basically, um, you know, you, you can see we've nested the flexures kind of in the walls so you can get much larger range in the same size. Um, and so this is, this is very valuable flexure to have these curved blade flexures. The, the question is though, do curved blade flexures have different degrees of freedom? than normal flexures, uh, you know, just f f uh, normal rectangular blade flexures? And the answer is no, they don't they actually have the same, but we're, we're gonna prove it. But the, unlike rectangular blade flexures that do satisfy the parallel um, conditions of an element, meaning they can connect the blue lines directly and fill the entire space, um, these flexures don't satisfy that condition. So there's actually not a single blue line, this is the one that comes closest to connecting the two rigid bodies and passing entirely through it without exiting it, but it doesn't quite make it there. It would have if I had put this block a little closer, maybe put it here, at least one would fit in it. But then there's, there's guaranteed many regions that could not be filled with blue lines, right? And this one doesn't work with any. So it does, definitely is not parallel. Um, okay, the way you would model it then is thinking about it as a bunch of parallel, uh, you know, traditional rectangular blade flexures stacked in series. So it's, it's obviously a serial element. You know, there's no question if you, you know, what, one way to ask yourself this question is to cut it up into um, small parallel modules and then, like I said, draw the schematic and you would unquestionably find this is a serial system. So therefore, this would be classified a serial element, okay? But, but let, me, let me teach you how then so that's, that's one way to think about this. It doesn't satisfy the parallel condition, so 
break it up, find pseudo rigid bodies in between, um, make the things that connect them parallel. Now you can draw the schematic. This would be a block, a, a spring, a block, a spring, a block, a spring, a block, and that, that's obviously in a serial configuration. So now you know it's a serial element, but how do you analyze how it moves? Well, um, what you could do is because this is in series, you could take the freedom space of this uh, and add it to the freedom space of that and add it to the freedom space of that, and then you have the freedom space of that. That's one way to do it. That's what we taught in the last lecture. Remember, uh, freedom space is stacked in series. Um, add together, they linearly combine, okay? But we also taught that you could find the intersection of constraint spaces in series, and that would find the final constraint space, okay? And that's the approach we're going to focus on in this lecture. So it, it turns out um, that when you're synthesizing serial flexure systems, it's useful to navigate them and synthesize them and analyze them using um, freedom spaces, okay? So you can pick intermediate freedom spaces and, and know if the system is going to be under constraint or not, right? But when we're synthesizing or analyzing serial elements, you'll find it's actually less useful to look at intermediate freedom spaces, look at freedom spaces at all, and really just look at constraint spaces and their intersection. And, and I'll make that a little bit clearer later why, but let's get some practice doing that since we didn't have that in the last lecture. So, so let's find the constraint space of a single blade, that's that, and it has you know, this uh, moment on it, recall, if we add the orange and blue and black lines, you know, it has this one black line that's filled in blue. Okay, and so that's, that's the constraint space of each of these three. And now, instead of adding them together, you find what's common between all three. Um, and then that'll tell you the, the full constraint space of this. Okay, so, well, they all point in the same direction a moment, so that exists, and they all have the same blue lines on the same plane. So the whole thing, um, this is what it's saying, identify what's common. The whole thing is this. It's the same thing. It's just a big blue plane with a black moment. And, and then, um, you know, obviously that links uh, to this freedom space right here. So, the, you know, it's the plane of the red freedom space with the black translation. So clearly this block, if you ground this down here, the final stage will move with, you know, every rotation on this red plane in a translation perpendicular to it, which is exactly the same freedom space as a rectangular blade. So we've, we've one, proved that uh, parallel rectangular blades um, achieve this freedom space, and um, they have the same freedom space as a curved um, uh, blade that is not parallel but is clearly serial from a schematic standpoint and it, you know achieves the same freedom space uh, okay and so this also obviously has an order of constraint of three it's also not over constrained any more than a rectangular blade is it just has an order of constraint of three so same freedom space same order of constraint uh, same behavior um, and and it's a but it's a serial element instead of a parallel element okay so one, one question you might ask yourself, you have to be careful when you're analyzing. So let me go back here. Um, you know, the question is how many of these blocks did you choose? Like, like what if we had chosen, what if we had chosen every little tiny inch, we put like a pseudo block there and then another little thing, a pseudo block there and a tiny thing and then a pseudo block there. So now it's a bunch of living hinges kind of all the way along there. Um, well, if you broke it into that, you know, one, you know, you, you, if you added these little wedges there and you made and you chose so many wedges, um, you'd still be chunking it into parallel elements. You know, a living hinge, a little short hinge here, a tiny short blade is a, is a parallel element, as we've shown in that, that, that um, past lecture. And so we would still be able to chunk it into a bunch of parallel elements and we could put tons of wedges. The problem is is you could see, you look at that, and it would look like, actually, let me draw in here again. Okay. Now we're gonna run out of space here. Okay, so if you did this, okay, so, so if you made this like a wedge, and then you made this a wedge, and then you made this a wedge, and you made this a wedge, and you just kept going all the way up, then what you would get 
is, yes, this little chunk from there to there would be a parallel element, and it would get a rotation, okay? And then this would be a parallel element from there to there, and it would get a rotation. And this would be a parallel element, and it would get a rotation. And you just get a bunch of rotations that eventually fill out a disk. And it would look like, by analyzing it using fact, that actually a curved blade gets a disk of red rotations at the intersection of all the, um, uh, you know, the rotation of all the, the notch flex, or the, yeah, the, the living hinge, actually. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I think I've been saying notch flex this whole time. I meant living hinges. If you, if you, if you cut this into wedges so that uh, you make it into a bunch of little parallel living hinges, um, that get rotations about their hinge, the center of their hinge, then you're going to get a freedom space like this, okay? Which, which is incorrect. The, the correct freedom space is, um, right, uh, the, the plane. You know, you, well, first of all, you'll notice, you'll, you'll notice that this plane contains that disk. First of all, that, that will always be the case. But that disk will not be correct if you analyze it that way. And so... The rule is, is break it into as few wedges as possible, right? So, so for instance, if we go all the way back to these designs, you could have chopped it into a bunch of small little pieces, and, and it would still be considered serial because it's a bunch of parallel elements stacked in series. But if you took the freedom spaces of those and added them all together, it may not be correct, okay? The, the, the smallest number of parallel elements this can be broken into is two, one of those, and then one of those again on top of itself, right? And so what, what you really want to do is break this into as few wedges as possible. Like, in fact, maybe we could have just done one wedge here and drawn blue lines, but it actually looks like for this design that wouldn't have worked because there would have been regions that wouldn't have been filled in blue. Okay, so, so you really need to uh, break it into as many wedges as you need to to make sure all the subsequent elements in between can be can be sati you know can can satisfy the parallel conditions so that they're they're filled entirely with blue lines that fill their geometry and and and, and uh, never exit at any point and, and there's no regions that aren't filled blue but with as few wedges as possible to do that okay so not too few wedges so you're not breaking into parallel elements but not too many wedges so that you get a wrong freedom space, okay? And, and I, I understand there's some ambiguity. It's like, well, you know, maybe if you kept it curved, maybe you need three wedges or something. But, but trust me, you'd have to break it into a lot of little wedges before the freedom space is analyzed incorrectly, okay? So, so pr pretty much you, you, can, you can pretty safely break it into quite a few wedges and, you know, to make sure each of the elements that connect all the wedges are truly parallel. Um, and then take the constraint spaces or the freedom spaces of those elements, and, you know, add them to get the freedom spaces together to find the final freedom space, or find what's common between the constraint spaces to find the constraint space. And, and if you do that, you're pretty safe. Just don't go overboard and make too many wedges. Okay? So I, I think I repeated myself like a hundred times, but I just want to make make that clear. Um, as, as do as few wedges as possible. Okay? But still be able to chunk it into parallel elements, and then you'll. When you analyze it, it will be, it'll give you the correct freedom and constraint space. Okay. All right, so let's look at this one. Say we took a blade and just cut out this weird serpentine thing. So this is still really thin, and that's basically a blade flexure. Well, by the same token, you could see, you know, um, we, we, we'd have to chunk this into wedges. Maybe put a wedge there, and you could fill this whole thing in blue. So this is a parallel thing. And then maybe chunk it here, and now this is now another parallel thing. Then chunk it here, and this is another parallel thing. You can go all the way along, and, and you, could, you could find out what's the fewest number of wedges to fill the whole thing in blue by connecting blue lines that connect the, the wedges and, and their bodies um, and make sure they don't exit the geometry, you know, pass, satisfy those conditions. And then look at all their freedom spaces, add them together, or um, get practice from this section by taking their constraint space to find out what's common, and you'll see by the same logic, it's the same freedom space, same translation, two rotations, basically a red plane, um, uh, it basically like this freedom space, red plane and translation, okay? Um, and so really, that, that's instructive. Any, if you take any uh, diaphragm flexure and cut it in any way or put slits in it or anything, 
you, you know, as, as long as you don't get these so thin that it, at, at any point it becomes like a wire flexure, if it, it still acts like a bunch of blades all connected together um, in any shape, it's going to be the same freedom space. It won't, it won't change the freedom space. That, that's very useful to know. Okay. Okay, let's look at this. Um, you know, this one, we said, it, you know, it's, it, it, uh, there's obviously no blue line. Um, you know, if you have a bent blade flexure here, there's obviously no blue line that can connect the two rigid bodies, so it's obviously not parallel. It's also obviously serial because it's, it, it's clear to see that the fewest ways you need to chunk it up into parallel elements, which is just one parallel blade, one parallel blade there, so there's like a pseudo body at its corner. That's obviously the, the fewest ways you can break it up and and if you analyze it you'll get the right answer and everything so but and it's also obvious to tell it's a serial element because that would be serially configured it would be you know a, a rectangle a spring a dot a spring and a rectangle right and the reason it's a dot is because it's a line dot or curve right so on a schematic and it can only be a dot right so so it's clearly serial okay so let's analyze its constraint space let's take the um let, or its freedom space let, let's find yeah, again, we could take the freedom space of this and add it to the freedom space of that. Um, but another way you could do it is take the constraint space of this, which is this blue plane with this moment, and take the constraint space of this blue plane moment and find what's common. Well, do they both share the same moment in the direction? No. Uh, they actually don't share anything common except the blue line at the intersection. Okay? So, so that is the constraint space of this block. If this is grounded, this whole thing acts as if it's like a wire flexure at its hinge there. And you can see a wire flexure essentially achieves five degrees of freedom, you know, two translations and three rotations. And you can see all, all of those here. Here's the rotation and translation, rotation, rotation, translation. I've, you, you know, it, it, you might like to put the arrow on top of the body you're actually describing, but again, um, translations don't have locations, so you can put them wherever you want. I, I just kept them here so you could think like an old engineer um, with, with uh, the coordinate system, okay? But notice that that pertains to the stage's degrees of freedom, not the, not the hinge. It's just s located at the hinge, okay? Or, or the, the bend. Okay, so, um, so if this is its freedom space, or if these are the degrees of freedom, then um, you know, you can see it's the same thing as if you had it grounded here on a body with a wire. It's the same, same degrees of freedom. So a wire is completely synonymous with a bent blade. Okay, so the, the bend in the blade there, it acts like a, a wire constraint. It's, it's kinematically equivalent, okay? You might remember we brought up the concept of kinematic equivalence, I, I think, in the last lecture where you know, if you stack a bunch of parallel blades, or stack a bunch of blades on top of each other, and rotate them 90 degrees in, in series, that's like kinematically equivalent to a wire. And anytime you have a design with a wire, you can swap it out with, um, with one of those. Well, here's another case where anytime you have a wire, you can just swap it out for a bent blade. And that, this is very useful. Sometimes you come up with very interesting designs that are way better than the designs with wires that are also easier to fabricate if you just swap it out with this kinematic equivalent. So I, I can show you an example of how that could work. So here is a, here's a tabletop flexure. We, we built this in one of our examples. Um, you know, it's got uh, four constraints. So you're thinking, well, six minus four is two. It has to have at least two degrees of freedom. But, uh, you know, you look at those and it's like, well, of those six, these are really the only three that remain. Um, two translations and a rotation. Okay, and, uh, and therefore you know one of these is redundant, which, which it is, and there's no culprit there. Okay, so that's just a review. Okay, so that's how it would move. But, but now say, you know, you, you design this, say you want to swap it out for those bent blades so you have a kinematic equivalent. Well, what you would do is you would just maintain these blue lines and you would have, you know, bend a blade where the bend aligns with those blue lines. See. So here's a ground, here's the bent blade where its, its bend is right there, and then it goes and attaches on the stage like that. And you can see all four. So I'll go back and forth between those so you can kind of stare at it. This is an equivalent, kinematic equivalent version of the last one, okay? And indeed it will move with the same degrees of freedom because it's kinematically equivalent, it's the same constraints, okay? 
And um, there you can kind of see it. Here it's a little hard to see. Um, if you look at the slides, there's actually blade flexures there. I probably catted them a little too thin, certainly thinner than these. So you can see it there. But uh, you can see as it deforms, it, it 